The following is a brief response to, and somewhat of a summary of, Jacob Bernowski's 1956 book, Science and Human Values. This started out as my written book review to post online, but with the increasingly strict censorship policies and character limits that are coming into play now, I figure why should I add to somebody else's database when I could just put it on my own channel? So here it is, for better or for worse. Hope you find value in it. My review carried this short title, Science and Art Are Not So Separate. We Improve by These Creations. It's tough to encapsulate a book like this. Excuse this review for being misleading and dropping some of the original's nuance. As long as you will understand and forgive my limitation, then I will describe to you the spirit of the book as quickly as I can. There are three chapters that comprise Bernowski's Science and Human Values, and the book's central argument is spread evenly over them. The general sentiment of the book is as an instruction, so that one may begin to learn to prefer concept understanding to specifics. In this sense, as one starts to see more of a forest and less of its trees, the narrowing of perception falls away, making room for an emergent value system. Science and art, for example, both considered as acts of creation, are thus part of, and inextricably linked to, a refined value system. Note that all three chapters overlap in terms of their conceptual content, but the first chapter begins as an examination of creativity, and then the second develops this as a framework for a shared truth. The book seeks to expose commonalities that exist between seemingly disparate acts of creation, such as art and science. To see unlike things as somehow similar, this is the source of creativity. Patterns are spotted in both art and science by creative minds. As such, seeing them as a dichotomy is false because the disciplines are not so different. Bernowski sees different types of work as sharing a common motivation in exploration, and thus a common root in humanity. If I can capture the essence of the thought here, it is to consider, using the following dimorphic statement, that art without science is meaningless, and science without art is motionless. Great leaps are made only by finding commonality in strange places, be it visual distortion to draw emphasis, poetic metaphor for effect, musical relation of feeling, rhetorical device for persuasion, comedic hyperbole, satire, or some other stretched similarity. The recognition of shared likeness becomes the expression of humanity from one person to another paving a path to a common value system. The third chapter is where I was pressured to diverge slightly from Bernowski's view. The previous sentence is written with the admission of some arrogance on my part, though. Perhaps I am a bit too cynical. But I found it difficult to entirely adopt the notion that ends and means become identical in a perfect morality. There will always be found challenges to any given system at extremis. To admit that contradiction is inevitable is only to say that perfect cannot be attained on any infinite timeline. New information will be continuously emerging, and so any system of refinement itself will, even at its best, still yield paradox eventually. Knowing this much, makes us wise to adopt utilitarian principles on occasion when necessary. This is to say that I will argue happily that any value system incapable of conceding to the need for periodic flexibility has become hindered by the weight of its own idealistic ambition. While Bernowski was a great man whose point I wholly appreciate, I cannot in full honesty consider ends and means to be identical, no matter that art and science exist only 
as Bronowski notes that Blake writes, quote, minutely organized particulars. Though there could be the distillation of a perfectly refined, self-correcting value system out there, we imperfect creatures would still lack the capacity to make use of it. In the meantime, for us who find ourselves still lacking, we must tentatively adopt the, quote, general good sometimes, even though it may be the, quote, plea of the scoundrel, hypocrite, and flatterer, as Blake also accused. To press my quibble further, I must insist that aligning science with art to converge them as one creative spirit will be useful only to a limited extent. Science can be a perfect error-correcting mechanism only where it is fully embraced. In our own modern world, much of thought is dominated by superstition and wishful, magical thinking. So long as this condition is still the norm, creative thought can be a threat to the little light of science, which, ever contrarian, finds itself at constant risk of being extinguished by popular opinion. Seeing also how science is polluted as a modern enterprise makes me even more skeptical that its modest flicker could ever be self-sufficient in realization. Corporate, governmental, and other special interests all seek to conform science to whatever will best suit their expectations. Clearly, morality requires more creativity than just a system we trust enough to always fall back on. As far as ethical development goes, error correction is a great trait, but the unassailable algorithm remains yet to be designed. In general, Bernalski argues that it is a great risk to allow ourselves to become too much one or the other, art or science, because to be divorced from one of our great, inseparable aspects is to see less of the truth. The book concludes ethical development to be another outgrowth of creative thought, enabled by such intellectual endeavors as art and science. The outgrowth is presented as a light that enables the perception of, quote, sharpness of outline, a perfect and inspired metaphor to see the distinction of things still invisible to our less creative, more animalistic relatives. Thus, justice is seen by the strange light of our poetry, of our clever ability to discern and appreciate one harmonious note out of a sea of dissonance. Do I recommend the book? Without question. It has been a privilege to hear his voice in my head as I consider his thoughts. Bernalski's analogies become my own, to now and then use at my own discretion, so that I might connect the disparate occurrences of my own life with the occasional creative thread. And so we go, developing. Addendum. Today is the next day, and there's still something that I'd like to add about the final chapter. It's a concept that deserves mention in any fair evaluation of the book. This third chapter is called The Sense of Human Dignity. Consider the following quote from it. Quote, Independence, originality, and therefore dissent. These words show the progress. They stamp the character of our civilization as once they did that of Athens in flower. Bernalski held thought of this form as an ideal. To call free thought a value here would be to undersell it. Imagine the artist who, for the sake of decency, avoids painting the topic that really inspires him. How genuine, how moving will his art be to the viewer? Is art that has been contrived in such a way really art at all? Next, Imagine the scientist who, for the sake of yielding a culturally inoffensive result, avoids research in a particular domain. How objective is her method? Is her research, are her results, results at all? Both cases would lead us away from any reasonable definition of truth. Both cases shy away from advancement for safety. Simply put, stifled thinking is antithetical to both art and science. 
The unconstrained mind is a furnace of creativity, and advancement simply doesn't move without it. There still remains some work to be done here if one wishes to permanently attach this free thought value as something we ought to employ, and that's a topic for another essay. That said, it would be difficult to argue that the inspiration of creative truth isn't somewhere near the heart of human dignity. Each of us looks to find this dignity in our own work, no matter how complex or routine. From a neatly painted wall or a well-organized spreadsheet to an airtight geometric proof or a carefully crafted meal, our dignity is found buried in a mountain of mixed problems, both material and abstract. And with these, our daily tasks, again, so we go, to develop. As we do this developmental dance, independent thought will be necessary if we want to add improvement in as any sort of accompaniment. Science here acts as one leg of the dancer, ensuring a secure stance with an adherence to observable reality. The other leg, of course, is the artistic chance, the willingness to take the next risky step. Missteps are forgiven, and we thus improve, as our partner smiles upon us, granting us a modest approval for the effort, which we can then trust has been dignified. Okay, I want to leave it there, but I also want you to consider one final quote from Bronowski, this time from the first chapter. Use the following perspective to go about developing your own daily dance with dignity. Consider this idea as you seek, and help us all to find, new creative patterns. Quote, For order does not display itself of itself. If it can be said to be there at all, it is not there for the mere looking. There is no way of pointing a finger or camera at it. Order must be discovered. And, in a deep sense, it must be created. What we see, as we see it, is mere disorder. Disorder.